Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today it is my privilege to welcome a fellow YPO member, a very accomplished businessman from Singapore, Brandon Chia. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ash. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Brandon is uh, an LLB from MUS Singapore. He is the chairman and CEO of HDI Family of Companies. And these groups are in, his group is involved in marketing, advertising, financial services, and property holdings. Brandon, tell me, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or career? So that is, that's a great question. So in terms of career, uh, I remember it was, I think, sometime in 2007. And I was alone sitting on a balcony. I had just moved over to the Philippines then as a family business we had different companies across southeast asia and philippines was one of the countries that my dad said you know go there do something about it if you you know if you screw up doesn't matter so he gave me that freedom and i was sitting out a balcony then and and i felt like a slave to the system Mm -hmm. i felt i felt stressed i was very constricted and and i felt very uncertain i remember asking myself this one question i said do i want to carry on my life and the way I'm running this business as a business owner or as an, with a mindset of a business owner or the mindset of an employee. And, and there and there, I made a decision. I said, no, I want to carry on this with the mindset of a business owner. Mm-hmm. And somehow rather, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subtle shift, but it's a shift nonetheless about how I started approaching problem solving and how I started looking at my, my team, my teammates and, and, and what, I, what I felt I wanted to achieve. Mm-hmm. So rather than try and constrain myself and work within the system, I started exploring new possibilities and stamping my own personality okay. in the business itself. So that was one milestone. Mm-hmm. The other milestone was when I had a talk with my dad. So family business again, and, and he decided that he wanted to step down. But uh, before we did that, we had a heart-to-heart talk. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't about the birds and the bees, right? It was more of... It was more of him trying to understand my value system and my direction and my approach. Right. And when we started sharing that, how employees would be treated, how enterprises would be treated, what really was important to me and where I saw the vision of the company, after that two-hour chat, he said, okay, I'm comfortable now. You can take over the business. Fantastic. And so that was also a significant milestone. Wonderful. The third milestone was acquiring our building in, in Indonesia and turning into our HQ. So there were lots of extensive renovations and all that. But when it finally came together, it wasn't just a physical place that we created. It was more of a space that our enterprises could call home, mm-hmm. right? It was a place which uh, they would be proud to bring their prospects to. Mm-hmm. And most importantly, it was a dream of my parents to have their brand on a building. They didn't say where, but they said it would be nice to own a building with the brand on it. And, and to me, I was able to deliver that and, 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 and seeing my parents so happy and proud when they came down for the opening, that was really a milestone for me too. Fantastic. Fantastic. Brendan, let's talk about, about HDI. Let's start mm-hmm. with the story of Mr. Peter Chia. You know, I'm yeah. reading about you. So tell me about that story and how he got this all started. So, so my dad, Peter, is a maverick. He's always been a maverick, mm-hmm. right? Always punched above his weight, uh, always did things differently. In university, he was a double maths major, came out um, and started selling um, IBM computers, mm-hmm. mainframes, right? The big, the big machines. And he had clients like the CPF board and all that. So it was doing pretty well. But then he felt that there was an artificial ceiling mm-hmm. in the organization where the expatriates were valued a lot more than the locals. So even though he was doing well, granted, he's, he is not the easiest person to get along with at that point in time. But still, he met his targets, he achieved his KPIs, except for the fact that uh, he was overlooked for a promotion. And so he started looking out for opportunities. And he came across this Times Magazine article in 1984, talking about how Ronald Reagan was taking this uh, president's lunch bar, which was made out of bee pollen. And that, for some reason, intrigued him. You know, my dad wasn't a fitness guy or wasn't interested in nutrition, but I think he said, he, he thought to himself that was a real opportunity there. And that was a great story. If the president of the United States is taking this product, he thought he could sell it. Great. And, and so he reached out to the 
to the supplier. And at that point in time, you really had to dig deep. You didn't have the internet to, 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 to track mm-hmm. it down. So he really dug deep to, to, to find who the supplier was. Uh, got in touch with him, managed to order a carton of products, got it into Singapore, and then scratched his head because he had no idea how to sell it. <laughs> so he started putting it in all these medicine shops and all that because, I mean, they were, they were lunch bars, so they were way ahead of their time. People were not consuming lunch bars the way they are today. So he put them in medicine shops because he couldn't afford putting them in, in, in the supermarkets and the, and the department stores then. And they all went bad. Okay. Right. Even before he sold a single bar, they all went bad. And so he, he felt really, really sad collecting these products back and looking at them and, and, and that it's moldy and it's hard. And he, he pretty much wanted to give up. But my mom stood by him and says, there's something great about these products. I think you should carry on. Mm-hmm. So because of that, those issues, um, he then had to, to figure out how he would want to market or sell the products. And so he devised a, a different way of marketing it by inviting or, or, or reaching out to people who would directly sell it for him as opposed to putting it in a store. And uh, his first meeting, he, he put up a little small little notice in the newspaper, got 20 people coming. I think he got 20 people coming in and three of them walked out having signed up for the business. And that's exactly how it started. Wow. And the reason, why it's high, yeah, the reason why it's high desert is because that's where our products come from. Uh, they come from the high deserts of Arizona. Right. Mm-hmm. And you continue to sell the same product, is it? Yeah, we continue. We don't do the lunch bars, but we continue to sell the supplements. They're, they're a second generation now. Um, I'm second generation and our families get along. So it's almost like a family to family kind of business relationship now. Fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Brandon, when you got into the business and you were telling, just telling me about how when you, know, you were interviewed by your dad or you had a heart to heart chat by your dad. Yeah. You took over. And then you came into the business and you rebranded your network marketing as social network marketing. Yes. Tell me about this uh, and why you did this. So in our industry, when you talk about multi-level marketing, and that's how we distribute our products, Correct. immediately you get almost like a physical reaction from people. Correct. They either don't understand it or they pretty much shun away from you like you're some vampire coming to suck on their blood, right? And the reason why is because, unfortunately, our industry has a bad name for the sheer fact that there is a lot of over-promising and there's a lot of under-delivering. And the people that you attract into the business are people who want to get rich quick. But they don't want to do anything. They don't want to, they don't want to put in the effort. But in any case, any business that you go into, you need to be able to put on the effort, put in the effort in order to, to get returns. And so we were running our business very differently. We are focused highly on education. We were focused highly on entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and we were delivering the best possible products that we, that we could. And so when we, we ended up having an internal discussion about how our business really operated and came to the conclusion that it's really marketing to your social network, Correct. right? Your immediate, your, your peers, your friends. And it's, it's kind of like if you watch a good movie, you'd be happy to tell your friends and your peers about a good movie. If you receive some kind of benefit, like, like, for example, you know, you go around and, and people say, hey, look, no, Ash, you've lost a lot of weight. What did you do? You're looking great. Obviously, you'll be very happy to share that story. Okay. And so we realized, that, we realized that it's really more about marketing to your social network. And so we decided, let's carve ourselves a new space. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's call ourselves a social network marketing company. And let's respect the social aspect. We don't want to come across as or teach our enterprises to just sell, sell, sell and and, and burn all your bridges if they don't buy from you. But we really feel that it's something where it can build bonds. It's an exchange of information and it's an exchange of benefit. And, and, and we didn't want to do the whole hard sell that other companies were doing. So that's why we, we, we positioned ourselves more as a social network marketing company. Amazing. Amazing. And moving on, you know, I had so much fun reading about uh, you. You know, you also introduced uh, something called tribal law. Tell me what yes. this is and how that impacted your business. So tribal law is a theory that I came up with when I was trying to make sense of things. Right? I was trying to figure out why do companies do well when they are the smaller state and after that, as they scale, they grow, it becomes more complex. Why do countries become more complicated, more complex as they scale and grow? And, and personally, I felt that you know, space, living space is important. 
Mm -hmm. uh, having enough space now. So I started trying to figure out where our roots were as human beings. Correct. You know, how did we live? And, and then it struck me, you know, the animal kingdom itself has a natural order to things. Lions have a pride and there is an optimum size. All right. Um, you talk about uh, any other, like, like, like a community of elephants, a herd of elephants would have a, a certain size. And every time there is a, there's a, it grows bigger than it needs to be they would leave, there would be a fight or, or, or they might leave or this and that and people start up something new. So I realized that human beings are the same. We, we have a natural size and that's, that's called a tribe, mm. right? And there's a natural law that governs this tribe. If you think back about, about like the way human beings were, you've got a, you've got a village headman or, or a tribal chief mm. and, that, and that person rules over three to four families. And there's this thing called the tribal law, which means that it is unspoken, but there is a process or there is a way of going about resolving conflict and differences, you know, that doesn't necessarily make it black and white, but there is some kind of allowance for mistakes and some kind of restitution. And so someone was telling me like in the tribes, you know, you talk about adultery and you talk about things that happen that destabilize the, the, the continuity of the tribe, there is a particular process that drives for some tribes that this, uh, there's a particular process that, 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 that recognizes that a wrong has been done. Restitution needs to be made. But if the couple still chooses to be together, even after suffering through this particular process, mm -hmm. then they are banished from the tribe and they are asked to live elsewhere. Very nice. Okay. All right. So okay. when we think about tribal law, I feel that there, is, there should be continuity in the way cultures and values are passed on from generation to generation. There needs to be respect for that. Mm. But when you just have so many people mm. around, you, you exceed the natural order of human beings relating to one, to one another, okay. then everything falls apart. Mm. And then you have laws, artificial laws that come and govern you by way of states and all that, which I, I personally don't feel is effective. So Very interesting. So... so at the same time, in this kind of setting, I think there's very little room for deviation. There's very little room for accommodation of new practices or, or new ide ideologies and, and, and thoughts. So that's why I realized, what is the next best thing? Because obviously, you know, having a thousand people or 10,000 people or a million people in a space like a country, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But I looked at it and I says, well, many family-owned businesses or small family businesses, they would have anywhere from... 10 people to say about 50 people as employees. And, and, and to me, that, that is now your new tribe, right? That's where companies define values. Why do we need to define values? It's because you're trying to find some kind of common language among these individuals such that they can all coexist together happily, that they have one common direction and one vision and that they feel productive when they work. And so this is the new tribe. And so business owners are the village chiefs and the tribe owners. And they also have a responsibility to govern their tribe. And so that's why, that's why I said it was, it was really important for me to come and form this connection and, and, and understand also the, the responsibility that all of us have in curating the value system of our immediate community, our group, and especially our companies. Terrific. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about the value and culture of uh, HDI. Mm -hmm. And again, in, you know, when I was reading, you, you, you introduced three words in your values, which was live, learn, love. Yep. Tell me about these and how did all your multiple tribes accept this? So this was a really interesting experience. I'm a big proponent of learn, mm -hmm. huge. I love learning. So I knew that I wanted to learn as, 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 part of the, as part of the value, mm -hmm. right? And live, live is because it's a natural manifestation of the supplements that we have and we want people to live well, etc. So I, I was telling my dad, I was like, you know, dad, I really like learn. I want our tagline to be learning to inspire. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, oh, that's great. That's nice. But what about love? And I'm like, huh? What do you mean? What about love? Mm -hmm. And so my dad in 2005 started introducing the concept of love in companies, in organizations. And we all thought he was nutty. We all thought he was mad. I mean, who talks about love? Mm. in a company where we don't even talk about love at home, right? right? Families didn't usually talk about love like, like 10, 15 years ago, and, and probably many families still don't. And so my dad was a big proponent of, 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 of saying that love is something that binds us and love is something that needs to, 
to be part of our our DNA. Mm. And so I said, okay, let, let's take a step back. I like learn. You like love. And our business stands for living well. So why not live, learn, and love? Wonderful. And that became our tagline and that became our value statement. And um, to your point of how do you interpret? So I, I like to use the example of uh, Batman and Superman. Why is Batman probably more well-loved than Superman? And, and we're talking about in the 1950s or 60s. Yeah. And, and my point is that Superman is, is, is at that time, was just a superhero, mm -hmm. right? That had powers beyond any human ability, but was very one, one way. He was great. He stood for something, but that's it. Whereas Batman was very multifaceted. There was a dark side to him and there was this and he was torn and he was angsty, but at the same time, he was noble and was trying to do something good. And so I realized that people prefer multifaceted personalities and characters that allowed them to interpret and manifest their own their own value system into it. So, so rather than put down a value that boxes it up and says, well, I'm not that and therefore I don't subscribe to a value, why not leave it relatively open-ended such that people can interpret this value the way that it resonates with them. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, and so I, I, I share with my team, I said, if you really want to know how to interpret live, learn, and love, look at it this way. Live to learn, learn to love, uh -huh. and love to live. Wonderful. <laughs> and so this becomes a virtuous cycle, nice. right? And, and we do have a hidden Mickey in our values. So if you take two letters of live and you take two letters of learn and you take two letters of love, it actually spells out a word and that's evolve. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we've got a fourth value in there, which is evolve. So the faster you live, learn, love, the faster you evolve as a human being. Fantastic. I've never heard anyone define their values so so nicely and so crisply. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> My next question to you, Brandon, is that, you know, how have you blended spiritual sustainability with business? So, so that's, a, that's a tough one. When we talk about spiritual sustainability, we talk about the natural hierarchy. Let's say, for example, men's most hierarchy of needs, right? After you resolve the whole food, water, shelter, and you go up to security and all that, eventually people are asking what's more. And so we see a lot of millennials and, and Gen Z guys or so like, what's my purpose? What, why am I living? Yep. And there are tons of courses out there, tons of people trying to help you to identify what your purpose is, why you are here on this earth. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about spiritual sustainability, it's about being, to, being able to address the spiritual needs of the people in a sustainable manner that they feel constantly engaged, mm -hmm. that they feel treated with respect, that they feel like they're individuals, but they're also part of a tribe or, or, or a bigger vision. Okay. And so when we, when we look at spiritual sustainability, what it means for me is that what is the common ground that we can design our business around okay. that would help people be the best versions of themselves or at least get to the best versions of themselves? Okay. All right. So, so we become kind of like a, like a platform, like an enabler. Hmm. Right, and that's how I position HDI. So HDI stands for High Desert International, and that's in reference to our, our products from the Mojave Desert and all that from Arizona. But at the same time, we break it down to an acronym. It's how do I? Oh, wow. Okay. So, so it's, it's more of an enabler. It's like, how do you achieve, attain the goals that you wish to achieve in life? You know, And we talk about spiritual sustainability. It's like when people reach up to a certain level, what are they looking for in life? How can we help them to find their purpose? How can we create a, a means or a way such that we guide them through a journey, a practical experience journey, right? To, to identify with or to recognize that they're not, you know, that, that journey, designing that journey, I think it's, it's extremely meaningful and being able to keep on going at it such that people go through this and, and they're on the tunnel, when they come out of it, they realize that they have have changed, they've evolved, they have embraced certain parts of themselves that they have otherwise would have forgotten or would have not been able to, to, to engage with. And I think that that's a lot more meaningful than just talking about dollars and cents. Fantastic. In fact, you know, uh, as you were talking just now, your other acronym from High Desert International to How, how Do I, How Do I is also a phrase for learning. It's a learning organization, right? And therefore, your new uh, acronym also fits into your live, learn, love values you know how do i is always a learning phrase 
That's exactly right. So it's how do I live, how do I learn, and how do I love? And Absolutely. you just keep on thinking about that. Yeah. Very true. So, Brent, I've got now time for a few questions for you personally. Okay. My first question is that what does success mean to you? You know, I could not help it. The moment I looked at the word success, immediately the ideology of family pops up. Mm -hmm. I think that when we anchor success to material goods and amount of money you have in your bank account, I think that's, that's drawn from the capitalist world. Correct. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a reference to, to how human beings should manifest success. And I think that success means, to me, relationships. Success means self-awareness. Success means being able to carve your little niche and the people that you have affected and, and in a positive way, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that success needs to be big. Success doesn't need to be small. I think success is, is, is more of more significance. Okay. Yeah. Next question to you is that, you know, given all the success you've had in terms of business and all the stuff that you have been doing, you know, from building your own office in Indonesia to all the other stuff, where do you draw your inspiration from? Inspiration is drawn from all over for sure. Okay. But I think that the best thing I ever did was to attend a mentoring masterclass um, run by YPO because down there, it really changed the paradigm where mentors are meant to listen, not so much to speak or to advise. And so that triggered me to start listening a lot more than talking. Mm -hmm. And just by the act of listening, you get so much more out of your interactions, out of, uh, uh, out of your social interactions, out of your business interactions, that just generates new ideas for me, right? Reading is, of course, another, another given where, you know, when you read things, I guess when you read and you've got a lot of things on your mind, reading helps you to manifest those ideas that resonates with you. And then you pick that up and you start thinking about it. And, and I like, I like, I've got this particular process. I mean, people talk about the OODA loop and all that. So I've got this framework, which is the four A's, right? Awareness. So knowing about something first or becoming aware of something. Then you analyze it to figure out where you fit in it. And then finally, and then after that, you take action. So you do it and then you take accountability or you be accountable for your particular action. And then with that awareness that you now have, you go back to analysis, action, accountability. And so, so when I talk about inspiration, when I talk about how I feel, what are things that drive me, it's usually going through this particular process as well. So it's just an emotion to trigger enough that you go through the awareness, analysis, action, accountability thing. And then my last question to you, and I come back to the pandemic and how it's affecting all of us in all around the world. How are you rethinking your business and your life in the new world order? Hmm. I am turning it upside down. Okay. <laughs> um, and the reason why is because I think we've been quite privileged. We, we, we are in the right space at the right time and we focus all on immunity supplements with um, our propolix mm -hmm. that's derived from propolis which is resin that, that, that bees collect from, from trees especially poplar trees and, mm -hmm. and then they use that as their self-defense mechanism so we've been very privileged to have worked with the Indonesian government and, and, and also been doing some clinical studies with um, COVID COVID related clinical studies that have done really well for us so so in terms of business, I think that's just taken off. Mm. But when I think about life itself, I, the reason why I say I've inverted it, because I looked at priorities and says, what exactly do I feel I have the most influence over at this point in time? Mm -hmm. And so I've got young kids, right? Three and five. Mm -hmm. I've heard from many parents, treasure your kids when they're young, because once that moment passes, you're never going to get it back. Absolutely right. And, and there's so many regrets. I mean, we are both in YPO and we talk to people. It's, what's your biggest regret? It's like my kids. What's your biggest regret? My relationships. What's your biggest re it's never about, oh, my biggest regret is I never made enough money. Okay. Never, ever that. It's always about relationships. And, and if you have kids, it's always about the children. True. And so I thought, look, if there's so many people saying that, there must be something there. Very true. So, so why not turn it around and say, during the formative years of my children where I need to build the right value system in them and I need to spend the right time in them while they still want to be with us, why not put family first? Mm -hmm. 
and then business later. And so when I rethink about my business and career, um, I'm a fundamentally lazy guy. Mm-hmm. I like to make sure that, you know, we've got the right processes in place so I don't need to spend um, too much time on it. Unfortunately, that's not happening during COVID. Mm-hmm. But, but my take on it was, was, was that I'm using my children as the motivator mm-hmm. for me to run my business decisions. They are now my priority, especially given the fact that I've, 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 I've been able to have a little bit more time with them and see them grow and see them make mistakes and, 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 and the joy. And so, and so my perspective is that it's family first. Yeah. But then, how do you marry this concept of family with business? Mm. And so we're, we're, we're in the network marketing industry and, and we talk about family. Family is big in our, our business and we are very proud to have spouses mm. with our enterprises mm-hmm. going through the journey. But then I was thinking to myself, look, man, I, I work hard and this time I spend in front of the screen and meetings and all that is taking time away from my family. Mm. You know, I'm not spending enough time with them. Right. So... So if I had, I was able to generate income with my family, wouldn't that be awesome? Mm. And, and then I start thinking, it's like, oh my God, you know what? That's actually something that's going to be relevant and important down the road. And so we are pivoting our business right now to focus on family first, which means that how can we help the breadwinner of the, of the, of the family be more engaged by working together with his or her children with his or her spouse in a positive manner and set up a real and true family business. Fantastic. And so, and so that's something that, that we're exploring and that's what we're rethinking, redefining our business, redefining what family business should mean mm. and how we are going to manifest that in our network. Wonderful. That's fantastic. news, Brandon, thank you. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. It, I wish you, all the tribes... And everybody in HDI, lots of success. Thank you so much, Ash. And I really enjoyed this too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.